Why do we love a rags to riches story? I think it's because hearing that a nobody can become a somebody, really somebody, gives us a glimmer of hope that it might be possible for us too. And then we start dreaming that even though life has knocked us down, we'll get back on our feet stronger than we were before. That even though we can't seem to catch a break, we will get where we want to go. That even though we can't see outside the storm right now, we'll come out of it soaring. One, lift off. We have a lift off. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see all of you. Thank you so much for being here. What an incredible morning. It could be on the first Sunday of November 38, cloudy and rainy, right? What a beautiful day. So glad you're here. You all look nice and refreshed with the extra hour of sleep. And if you did make it by the 1130 service on time, we have counselors after the service who are willing to help you. So you can, whatever. I'm so glad you came no matter what time you made it. Thank you for coming. You know, I have a confession to make today. I have a problem that has plagued me for years. Some of you know my secret. I've shared it with you, but it's time to get it out in the open. In fact, what I share with you this morning really might affect our relationship. You might lose some respect for me. You might not even think I should be a pastor here at Grace anymore. It's, but it's time to come clean. I'm a diehard fan of the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> See, I grew up outside Chicago, and every day, every day in the summer, I had the same routine. After I ate breakfast, I gathered up the neighborhood kids, went and played baseball till lunch. And then after lunch, we did something different. We gathered up the other neighborhood kids and we played baseball till dinner. And then after dinner, we did the same thing. We played baseball till dark every single day of the summer. And when there were no neighborhood kids to play with, I would throw the ball up in the sky and catch the ball myself, imagining that I was my favorite Chicago Cubs player. But much as I love baseball, you can imagine how I felt when the Cubs made the World Series recently. Now, here's the deal. Before you lose too much respect for me, and you send me a nasty email and decide to sever the ties with this church, there's something else you ought to know. After living in this area for 36 years, I have become a diehard fan of the Cleveland Indians. It's true. I started following the tribe. I went to some games. I became fascinated with this year's team. And most of the time, frankly, this dual allegiance didn't make any difference at all because the Cubs haven't won the World Series for 108 years and the Indians hadn't won the World Series for 68 years and they weren't meeting very often. But when both teams made it to the World Series, something had to give. For me, it was the definition of a dilemma. I know it's a first world problem, but, you know, so be it. As a fan of both teams, I had one of two choices. Either I couldn't win or I couldn't lose. So I went with, I can't lose. Every time the Indians would score, I'd cheer. Every time the Cubs would score, I'd cheer. It was a great series, one way or the other. Some of you feel a little bit like that. You feel like you're facing a dilemma on Tuesday. Only it's not because you're a deep fan of both presidential candidates or all the presidential candidates for that matter. And you're really not crazy about anybody who's running. In fact, maybe you feel that way about politics kind of all the time. Maybe you feel a bit disillusioned, maybe discouraged, maybe you feel like, what's the use? Almost 250 years ago, a man named Edward Gibbon wrote a book called The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. In that book, he lists the following reasons for the disintegration of the great Roman Empire. Number one, the rapid increase of divorce, including the undermining of the sanctity of marriage. Number two, 
higher and higher taxes. Number three, the mad craze for pleasure typified by the brutality of sporting events in the Colosseum. Number four, the building of giant armies when the real enemy was the decadence of the people. Number five, the decay of religion, which loses touch with life and becomes impotent to guide people. Some of you see parallels in our own country. And as you approach Tuesday, you're disillusioned. So this morning, I want to share with you several ideas that will help you sense spiritual victory in your life, no matter who wins Tuesday. In fact, these are ideas, these are principles that will help you not only this year, but in years to come. They are principles that describe the source of real hope for our nation. They are outlined by the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2. So if you have a copy of the Bible, why don't you turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2 or turn on your cell phone to 1 Peter chapter 2. And as you're turning, I want to remind you that the Bible says God has established three institutions in this world. The family, the church, and human government. In fact, in the book of Romans, Paul writes these words, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Some of you are thinking, well, what if I don't like the authorities? What if I don't like the government and what the government does? What do I do if I don't like any option on Tuesday? What if I just don't like my choices? But those are good questions. And I hope to answer some of those this morning. So you might want to take out a pen or pencil and jot down some of these ideas and take some notes this morning on your worship program. The Apostle Peter gives us some great, uh, some great insights in this section of Scripture, starting with verse 11. First of all, he says, when it comes to this issue, you better clarify the citizenship of your life. You better clarify the citizenship of your life. In 1 Peter 2.11 Peter writes it like this, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. You see, when Peter wrote these words, Nero was the emperor in Rome, one of the most infamous of all the Roman emperors, known for his brutality History tells us that Nero secretly ordered the burning of some of the buildings in Rome in order to provide space to build a magnificent palace for himself. But the fire burned out of control for five long days. Much of the city was destroyed. Nero looked for a scapegoat and he blamed Christians. As a result, persecution began to permeate the Roman Empire and persecution that may have just led to the martyrdom of both the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul. It was not a fun time to be a follower of Jesus. So with that in mind, Peter calls followers of Jesus Christ foreigners and exiles. In every country of the world, Every Christ follower fits that description. If you're a Christ follower this morning, you really are a foreigner and an exile. The Apostle Paul wrote these words to the Philippians. We are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we're eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. See, it's really easy to be confused about this issue. It's easy to be confused about our priorities. And I don't want you to misunderstand. Most of the people in this room today are citizens of the United States of America. I get that. And I am grateful more than ever for the country in which we live. I believe that God has blessed our nation far beyond the ways that most of us understand and appreciate, especially on this day when we're recognizing the persecuted church around the world. I recognize that God has blessed this nation in unique ways. And I believe that every citizen of this country has a responsibility to vote on Tuesday. I hope you'll do that if you haven't done it yet. 
And I hope you'll recognize that one vote just might make a big difference. As we approach this election, I'm reminded of something that I read years ago. In 1876, one vote changed France from a monarchy to a republic. In 1933, one vote gave Adolf Hitler the leadership of the Nazi party in Germany. In 1960, one changed vote in each precinct in Illinois would have changed the course of that presidential election. You ought to be informed and you ought to vote on Tuesday. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you claim to have a relationship with God, don't confuse your allegiance. You are first and foremost a citizen of heaven, not a citizen of this nation nor of a political party. You're a citizen of heaven. Years ago, the famous Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky was sentenced to die by the Russian Tsar. The Tsar loved to play cruel tricks on prisoners by blindfolding them and standing them in front of a firing squad. The blindfolded prisoners would hear the command to fire, the rifle shots would ring out, and then the prisoners would feel nothing. They would slowly realize that the guns had been loaded with blanks. Dostoevsky went through that very experience. He woke up believing it was going to be his last day on earth. He ate his last meal. Every breath was precious to him. Every moment was etched into his mind. As they marched him into the courtyard, he felt the heat of the sun like he'd never felt it before. Everything seemed to have a magical quality. He was seeing the world in a way he had never seen it. He was blindfolded. Shots rang out, and nothing happened. Then when he realized that he'd not been shot and was not going to die, everything changed. He became thankful for everything about his life and grateful for the people he had previously hated. I want you to know something. Because of sin, every one of us faces eternal death. But Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, paid the price for your sin and my sin when he died on a Roman cross. And when he came back to life, he proved that he could conquer the penalty of sin today and for eternity for every one of us. When you and I choose to place our faith, when we embrace what Jesus did for us on that cross, we receive the forgiveness that God offers us and our perspective on the things of the world around us begins to change. In just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to make that choice, to begin a relationship with God if you've never made that choice before. First thing you need to understand if you're going to make sense of what's happening in our culture, especially on Tuesday, is you better clarify, you better clarify the citizenship of your life. And then Peter goes on to say something else. You need to make sure that you create curiosity through your life. You need to create curiosity through your life. Look at verse 12. Peter says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now, if those words sound a little familiar to you, they should if you're a student of the Bible because Jesus said it like this, Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, the point is, if you're a follower of Jesus, there should be something attractive about your life, even in the minds of those people that don't agree with you, that draws them to you. If you're a follower of Jesus, your life itself should cause even those who oppose you to be attracted to what you have. And I want to ask you a question this morning. How attractive are you? I'm not asking how good looking you are. Some of us will never win that battle. But how attractive is your life to those who don't agree with you?
In his book, How Christianity Changed the World, a historian named Alvin Schmidt describes how the testimony, the impact of Christians changed the Roman Empire. By the fourth century, the testimony of Christians had led to the prohibition of infanticide, child abandonment, and abortion. Those three things have been outlawed. The testimony of Christians stopped the fights of the gladiators by the fifth century. He writes that Christians influenced the world in the area of prison reforms, especially to create separate prisons for women. Throughout Europe, the impact of Christians was significant. Human sacrifices were stopped. Polygamy was outlawed. Women gained the right to own their own property. Believers set up hospitals. All because believers, followers of Jesus Christ, were committed to this principle, letting your light shine before others that they might see your good deeds and glorify God, might be pointed to Him. One man wrote these words, it's better to do something for one person than to dream all my life about changing the world without ever doing anything for anyone. It's better to make a difference in a very small area of my community than to spend my time complaining about the state of the world. Amen. I'm going to read that sentence again. It's better to make a difference in a very small area of my community than to spend my time complaining about the state of the world. I couldn't agree more. It's one of the reasons why I was so attracted to the story of one gal in our church who described the impact that her grace group has been having in this community. I want you to watch this little video for a minute. I thought I would sit down and email you about all the wonderful ways God has been working in our family's life. Wow, where should I begin? When we first started our grace group, we were a little nervous about who would be in it. We decided to completely give it to God and boy did he ever come through. After just a few months, we have all bonded so well and we are all passionate about outreach. We are filling families' cupboards with food, loving on kids who have been placed out of their parents' homes due to drug addiction. God truly blessed our group with people who take loving on the lost very seriously. In our home, things sure have been shaken up a bit. We went from enjoying peaceful Sunday afternoon naps to a house filled with teenagers. We've had teens message us asking about Jesus from Facebook posts to new kids at school coming over for a visit. God has placed many young ladies in our path that were searching for something more in life. All of them now attend church with us each week. They even come over for lunch after church and hang out with us. They're active in grace students and all have given their lives to Christ. It only took a small investment on our part. We planted the seed and God took over from there. One of them just walked up to me at church and said, I need you in my life. I think I used that same line on my husband when we were dating, so who can say no to that? About six months ago, I met a lady through social media. She is a single mom with some very serious daily challenges in her life. It didn't take long to see she was pretty bitter and angry about life. She was in a tough spot. My husband and I started praying for her and looking for practical ways to show her Jesus. We made a cake for her son's birthday and we took her a Bible. What we didn't know was over those six months, she was watching our lives. She needed to see these people who seem so filled with joy. Where was this joy coming from? She messaged me after I shared Clayton and Shari King's message and said, I need God in my life. I watch what you go through and you're still so happy. I need that in my life. And then she asked to go to church with us. I was so excited, I screamed. In John 13, 35, Jesus tells us, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. It's that simple. People just need to feel the love of Jesus through us. We are so thankful to be a part of Grace Church. 
Whether it's being in a Grace group, baking cookies for Grace Kids Camp, or serving in the Welcome Center, Grace gives us all the tools we need and endless opportunities to love on the people of Wayne County. We are the church, and people need to be where they are loved. Jesus will show us that when we step out in faith, lives change. We just need to take that first step. I love that story. Let me ask you a question. Who is in your life who would look at you and say, I need you in my life? How significant has your testimony been, your example been before others, that they would look at you and say, what is there in you? What's going on in your life? Something's different. You see, if I'm going to make sense of what's happening in our culture, I, I have to be willing to create curiosity with my life. I have to clarify the citizenship of my life. But there's something else that Peter identifies here. He says, I have to be willing to counter criticism by my life. I have to counter criticism by my life. Let's keep reading. Look at what he writes. Submit yourselves, therefore, for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. In Peter's day, Christians were often accused of atheism because they refused to pledge allegiance to the emperor as God. They believed that there was only one true God, the God of the Bible. And because they wouldn't pledge allegiance to the emperor, they were accused of atheism. Beyond that, they were accused of cannibalism and incest because of practices in their worship services, which were not, those accusations weren't true, but that's what they were accused of. Peter's argument is plain. The right response can silence ignorant talk of foolish people. Do you see that? An author named Bruce Ashford wrote these words. When you're in the majority, you're just free to tell people what to do, not to define your own terms as much, but when you realize that you're living in the middle of a pagan nation, then you have to work hard to interpret the culture, to understand the idols and the ideologies of the day, to understand how those have shaped people, and then to think really hard about how you interface the gospel with that culture. We have to learn how to do that in the United States. I think he's right. Then he makes this comment about what we write on Facebook. Listen to this. I just want to go steal the all caps and exclamation point keys off keyboards. He says it's the metaphorical equivalent of a guy walking into the public square just sweating and shouting for about 12 or 15 hours at a time. Even if you agree with the guy, you don't want to come near the public square because he's so obnoxious. That's our tendency and temptation right now. Christians of all people should be able to act civilly and not just civilly but with love. Civility is not softness. Civility is toughness. You can make your point and you can be tough with it, but it can be framed in a gracious manner. Your life, the testimony of your life, if you are a Christ follower, should silence the criticism of foolish people. In other words, when people look at us, they ought not to be able to see anything in us. That's a ground for accusation. Wow. Clarify the citizenship of your life. Create curiosity with your life. Counter criticism by your life. One more principle. Peter says we need to commit to commit consistency in our lives. We need to commit to consistency in our lives. And he summarizes everything that he's been saying with these words. Watch this. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves, show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, honor the emperor. 
Apparently, Peter felt he needed to emphasize the, re, the importance of showing respect, not just to those that agree with us, but to everybody. Now, that may sound innocent, but it can have a powerful impact. And when I think about consistency, I can't think of any place where consistency is more significant when it comes to our relationship with our government than with prayer. The Apostle Paul wrote these words to Timothy. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and for all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. I have a good friend named Randy. He posted these words on Facebook not too long ago. He said, can we as Christ followers let go of our political emotions and aspirations and pray for those in authority as instructed by the Apostle Paul? Can we believe that our God is still in charge regardless of the one we put in the White House? I, for one, he writes, I'm not, I, for one, am ashamed that I didn't pray for President Obama more and lead our church that way. It is time for the church to come together, putting Christ and his word first in our lives, living for him, showing the country that the gospel changes lives. Amen. 3,000 years ago, the people of Israel wanted a king in order to be like the nations around them. The king, they believed, would symbolize strength. He would give a sense of authority and credibility to the nation. He would provide a sense of power and security. But most of all, the nation of Israel had not bothered to approach God and ask for his blessing and his leadership. God later told the prophet Samuel, it's not you they've rejected, they've rejected me as their king. The problem in that day is the people had taken their eyes off of God. They believed, listen, they believed that an earthly candidate would provide safety, power, and security that God could not. Sounds kind of familiar, don't you think? That's a dangerous trap, folks. It's a trap for us. Nowhere should our consistency be more evident than when we pray for our leaders. In the spring of 1940, Half a million soldiers were trapped on the shores of Dunkirk in Europe, waiting for the inevitable imprisonment or death at the hands of the Nazi war machine. At that desperate moment, King George VI of England issued a call for a national day of prayer to be held on Sunday, May 26th. Nobody could have anticipated what happened that weekend. Adolf Hitler, with victory in his grasp, inexplicably ordered his armies to halt. On Sunday, May 26th, the nation of England began to pray. Church attendance skyrocketed. It was a turning point in the war. At 7 p.m. that night, a critical order was issued to attempt a desperate evacuation of Dunkirk. Every tiny vessel and private craft was sent across the English Channel with orders to rescue as many soldiers as possible before the arrival of the Germans. And Hitler didn't move. The armies of Germany didn't move on the 24th or the 25th or the 26th or the 27th or the 28th or the 29th or the 30th, not until early June. Nobody knows why. Hitler held victory in the palm of his hand, but he prevented his troops from finishing the job. There's only one explanation. Hitler's armies were halted by the same God who answered the prayer of Daniel 2,500 years earlier, and eventually 336,000 soldiers found their way across the British Channel to safety. It was the turning point in the war. I want you to know something. I believe 
there is only one hope for this nation and for this world. It is not a politician. It is not a political party. It is a spiritual awakening led by the people of God who are part of the church of Jesus Christ. It is the people of God living out their faith in a Christ-honoring way, people who are committed to countering criticism with their lives, demonstrating consistency in their lives, who've clarified their citizenship beyond any question. It is an awakening that is demonstrated with a clear sense of citizenship, lives that reflect the light of Jesus Christ, counter criticism, and demonstrate consistency. I wonder if you're willing to embrace today, to embrace that kind of life, to make that kind of life your life. Why don't you bow your head for a minute? could be that you came here today. Maybe you've been coming for several days or weeks and you realize deep inside that you have something that is lacking in your relationship with God. Maybe you do not have a relationship with him and today's the day when that relationship would begin. I told you earlier I was going to give you an opportunity to begin that relationship. Now's that time. Now's the time very quietly, wherever you're seated, would you say, this is for me, Bob. I know this is what I lack in my life. And today I want to begin a relationship with Jesus. Would you quietly pray with me, Lord Jesus, as much as I know how, today I turn from my sin, from my way to you. Today I embrace what you have done for me by faith. I believe that you died for me on a Roman cross so that I could experience forgiveness for all of my sin. And today, I'm beginning a new life with you. I'm asking you to be the director of my life. If that's your prayer, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to write today's date, November 6, 2016, 11 6, 16, on the little response card that's in your worship program. Just go ahead and take it out. And at the bottom in the box, just write today's date, 11 6, 16. For the first time, you're becoming a citizen of heaven. Now here's the deal. Many of us in this room have made that choice. So if you've made that choice, here's what I'd like you to do. Find that little card, that little worship, that little worship response card in your program. Take it out, and I'm going to ask you to do something. With a pen or pencil, if you are willing to pray, to pray for a spiritual awakening in our country, to pray for 30 minutes between now and Tuesday to get alone with God, maybe with your spouse, maybe with other family members, and for 30 minutes with your friends to pray, just to pray that God would send a spiritual awakening to our nation. It is our only hope. Only as we turn to Jesus Will there be real hope? If you're willing to do that, I want you to write the word pray, P-R-A-Y, in the box at the bottom of the card. And when you're done with the card, just leave it at the end of your row. Our ushers will pick them up in a little bit. Lord God, thank you so much for this time today. Thank you for the privilege of turning to you, seeing you at work experiencing your challenge in our hearts. We pray, we pray for one another. Help us to counter criticism by our lives. Help us to demonstrate consistency in our lives. Help us to create curiosity through our lives. Help us to be crystal clear about the citizenship of our lives. We pray for our nation. We pray that indeed you would send a revival, a spiritual awakening to our country and to this world as the church of Jesus Christ works in a way that pleases you, that honors you, brings glory to Jesus. All these things we pray in the name of Christ. Amen.